What makes a person true? True to words. True to the heart. True to purpose. The same questions arise for any person and for any civilization, in any time. Our story takes place many thousands of years in the future. Humans populate the entire galaxy, but still suffer from tribal and regional rivalries, as well as the quest for genetic purity and stable class structures. This is the story of the Phoenix, a colony ship, how it survived its encounter with the dreaded Galactic Fellowship, how class divisions found a bridge in the ancient game of chess, how a young girl came to understand what it meant to say she had two fathers. We begin ten years after the ship was saved on the planet Ganymede II, the destination of the colonists. And now, a young mother, Nin Ki San, puts her daughter, Ghana, to bed. Cortana, play music. What kind do you wish? Dance music! <laughs> Come on, time for bed. Said, time for bed. Tell Cortana to stop the music. Nobody else is going to bed. Cynthia isn't going to bed now. Kapil isn't going to bed now. You're not Cynthia or Kapil. You are Ghana. One thousand and first born of Ganymede too. I don't want to be one thousand. And first. One thousand and first born of our colony. First and only born daughter of my light of my life. Now stop the music and get under the covers. Okay. If I get a story. You are not to bargain with your mother. Cortana, stop. That's better. Now get. Mom, may I please have a story anyway? Not now, it's too late. But you said. You said that you would tell me the story of how I have two fathers. I said no such thing. Now go to... But you did! You said I had two fathers and you would tell me sometime. Well, perhaps I did. But you have only one father. I just meant that you should be very proud of your father and his... his brother. Why? Because his brother saved us all, saved the colony, and without him, there would be no you. Really? Yes, really. Well, then tell me, tell me, please, please! Well, perhaps it is time for you to hear this, but you will not understand it, not everything. And it is difficult for Mommy to speak truly about this. Why? You told me to always speak truly, always. Don't you want to? Yes, I do. I will. Now get under the covers and I will tell you the story. Okay. There now. Are you ready? Yes. Cortana, sleep music. Once upon a time, Long before you were born, there was an age of darkness. There were no explorers, no colonists. Everyone stayed on their home planets. Hope was broken for nearly 1,000 years. But one day, a new way to travel great distances was invented. And it was decided that mankind should reach outward to the stars once again. And so, great ships were built, colony ships with many thousands of people, most of them in suspended animation. Suspended animation? Suspended, sleeping like you are going to do. And the others were working, keeping the ship on course and maintaining the power systems. And you were in the engine room, right? Right. And that's where Dad was. No. Hush now, my daughter. 
Yes, I see him now. It all started near the beginning of my seventh awakening. I had 59 more waking days on my 65 day shift. I was in the Tesla compressor room doing maintenance when Ortho called to me. Dad, some hotshot from upstairs here to see you. What? Some ensign beam? Wants to see you. He looks like a genetic engineering special. You gotta be in trouble. Well, tell him I'm busy. This takes two hours. He says now. Nin Ki San! Oh, no. Yes? You are relieved of your maintenance duty? Come with me. But, sir, this procedure... ...can be completed by your teammate. This way. Yes, sir. Go on, San. I'll get the damn thing. Yeah, Henson, just be sure to give more work to the likes of Ortho. Sir, if this is about my performance... It's not. Then may I inquire what it is about? You may. Deck 12. The present need concerns utilizing your skills. Ensign Beam, I can assure you that my skills are fully utilized and very much needed in energy production. And you would be lying if you did. No, sir, I would not. Another lie. So soon. I suggest you not compound your sins. We both know you are grossly overqualified for your position. You've been passed over repeatedly because of your supposedly dubious genetic history. Your true skills are in war games, crisis simulations, and tactics of every kind. You are three-time champion of the District 9 games and a master of the ancient game of chess, which, by the way, figures in my family history, and through which I hope to... Level 12. Ah, here we are. This way. I prepared Meditation Room 6 for you. And so that was the beginning. My beginning. In a way, your beginning, little one. Presumptive. Insulting he was. Truly. And yet, a magnificent creature. Ortho was right. Genetic engineering. His chiseled physique, his shining eyes, his flowing hair. He moved with the grace of a panther. I could not hide my admiration. Truly, from the first moment there was a gleam in my eye, a deep well in my heart. And the room, little one, the room. <laughs> Never has there been such a room in which to play the game of kings. He had made the walls, the ceiling, and even the floor display the cosmos. Planetary systems, nebulae, stars, the swirling arms of our galaxy, the work of God, and endless rivers of white, silver, blue, red, and gold. And in the center was a chess set on a pedestal, all in crystal, reflecting the ever-changing lights. After a moment of awe, I spoke. I am most impressed, Ensign Beam. Thank you. I try. Clearly, the game has more than casual interest for you. Correct. Both aesthetic and practical. The chess set is a family relic more than 500 years old, from the crystal artisans of Bar Zoom 3. Ah, uh, yes. Aesthetics. The game itself is beautiful, and as for these pieces, I can see the workmanship, but the practical? Although I enjoy it, surely the ancient game is no longer of practical import. Untrue. Were it only for the boredom relief, it would be practical. As you will admit, the ship is nearly autonomous. We are awakened every 10 months and have duties for 65 days only. Because it is necessary biologically. True, sadly. You would prefer not to have duties. I would prefer to awaken on Ganymede 2 and start my new life. As would we all. But duty is the soul of man. Yes. So it has been truly said by the ancients. Shall we begin? Proceed. I know some basics. 
teach, but do not hold back. Play your best. I understand. Uh, let's try a standard opening. King's pawn forward, two squares. And I can move any pawn, or a knight. You could, but let's say you mirror the move like this. Only you move your pawn out just one square. Why would I want to do that? Your pawn is still protected by the other pawns. There is an old saying in chess, never lose a pawn and you will never lose a game. But of course, it is necessary to lose pawns. Now let's see. Suppose I move my knight out like so. What would you like to do? Mirror your move? You could, but let me show you something. You can now attack my pawn and force a pawn exchange. Move your queen's pawn. Huh. I see. You can take my pawn, but I can take your pawn right back. It's protected, as you said. Right. And now, let's see. Uh, by the way, after the first four moves in chess, there are four billion possible outcomes. Hmm. Like the universe. The possibilities expand after the initial moments. True. Let me escape your attack by moving my pawn forward. All right. Huh. You have invaded my territory. I need to respond. You can in a number of ways. But let's say you move your queen's bishop pawn out two squares. Yes, like that. Now you have three pawns out and I only have one. You have a defensive wall. I like it. I knew this would be useful. In the interest of our mission, I have something to confide. You must not repeat this information. I have been informed that the Fellowship is now attacking ships that come near their so-called domain. What? When did this start? Uncertain. The information came from the outskirts of our first wave realm, was sent back to Homeworld and retransmitted to the Phoenix. More than 50 years of Homeworld time have elapsed since the information was fresh. But we are in our seventh shift, more than a century and a half from home. Surely the danger has passed by now. Danger never passes. It merely hides. As a colony ship, we have virtually no weapons. Our core skirts what we thought were the edges of the Fellowship's domain. But things change. We must outthink them if a problem arises. Hence, it is wise to practice strategic and tactical games. I see. Your intent becomes more clear. Proceed with the game. Knight's pawn to a4. But now I can just take your pawn and I don't see any repercussions. You can. Go ahead. All right. It seems you are purposely giving me an advantage. Perhaps. I will move my queen's pawn forward like yours. But, uh, let me see. Yes, I will move out my knight to threaten your pawn. And ha! <laughs> Now the two sides are nearly mirror images, only I have the advantage, one pawn ahead. Well, I'll just move my end pawn out, like so. Suit yourself. Obviously, I'll take that pawn too. I'm quite sure I specifically instructed you to play your best and to give me no quarter. You have merely sacrificed that pawn. I will not have any wins I don't deserve. And so it shall be, Ensign Beam. There is another saying in chess. Beware the pawn sacrifice. And so it went. I took him through the classic openings, the gambits and the endgame, speed chess, and even chess 960 invented in the 20th century on old earth. He learned well, and of course I always beat him, for he would not allow me to grant him any advantages or play in less than earnest. Yes. It all went well, and he even smiled at me from time to time, and occasionally touched my hand unnecessarily. It was absurd to think that the mating commission would countenance such a match across cast lines, but I allowed myself such fantasies. My thoughts dwelled upon him, and my heart sought the rhythm of his soul. That is, until one day, one game, when everything went wrong. It was still a close game after 40 moves. Check. Knight to block. 
As I thought, my queen takes the knight. Rook to a8, checkmate. What? Impossible! You see it, don't you? See it? Of course I see it! I've lost 26 games in a row! I'm a fool! In Sunbeam, I have played my best exactly as instructed. Yet you simply cannot stand the fact someone of my class can beat you. That's it, isn't it? No! That is not it! Nothing is it! You're not beating me! No one is beating me! I am... I'm, I am... You have no idea. 500 years. A, a family. A family of... of, of pieces. You have broken some of them. I'll take them to the duplicator The duplicator? And... The duplicator. Is that all I'm ever going to hear? The duplicator. The duplicator. Duplicates are not the same. Not the same. They're not the same. You're relieved of this assignment. Please go. I could not reply. I was stunned into silence. What had I done wrong? Or was he a madman, temporarily insane? Silence from him the next day and the day after that. And with each passing day, I grew weaker, more hollowed out. The end of my shift approached and even Ortho perceived my distress. I will take over now, Ortho. Don't worry, Nin. He'll come back. He's in love is all. And of course, he can't stand it, you being beneath him and such. Just like the rest of them in High and Mighty. Never a real man among them, is what I say. I went to sleep then. Ten months of suspended animation by the ship clock, but almost eight years on our home planet. Time enough for more friends of friends and more relatives of relatives to have passed away. And that is what I felt like when I awoke from my next 65 day shift. Passed away. I expected him every second, hoped for a reconciliation, an explanation, a sign. But my shift passed without a word from him any word that might heal my heart. Again, I was put to sleep. I dreamt of talking chessmen and secret whispers of the ancients in the caves beneath old earth. I awoke again, and finally on the third day of my shift, Ortho delivered a message. Sam! In here. He says you're to meet him in 20 minutes in the room, whatever that is. I'll get this, go on. Just be sure you come back today. We've got work to do. I went to the meditation room immediately. I was in quite a state, even more so when I saw the room. He had restored the chess set. It sparkled as never before. Had he repaired his psyche as well? <laughs> Not knowing what to do, I decided to prepare myself through the wisdom of the ancients, as I have told you to do, firstborn, light of my life. For I needed to be able to speak truly. Tana, set the room display to images of the core. Play file 16 for my Aquinian music. Play Sister E's meditation on the core. The core. Home to our being, home to power, wonder, brightness, and unilluminated darkness without end. Home to strange stars, young and old, red giants, white dwarfs, energetic plasmas, pregnant with mystery, strange ministers all, ministers of emptiness, defending themselves against our inquiry. The core, the origin, a barrier to our science, a shield repelling our ships, none have returned. Process and power burn bright, but stillness reigns. Everything returns to its origins, from stardust to planets, from planets to seas, from seas to life, from life to humanity and humanity to the stars, we 
return. From stars to supernova, explosions creating stardust, feeding stardust to life, we return. From the one to the many, from the many to strife, from strife to unity, we return. From the false to the true, we return. Let there be a return, a return to origins, a return to humanity, for we ever return, return to God. You came. As you see? Yes. I I've see that you have... Uh, Please, go ahead. You repaired the chess set. I did. I thought it might be a sign. It was. I've been thinking. Repairing, you might say. You look well. Thank you. You were listening to something as I entered. What was it? Oh, nothing. It's just a poem from the ancients. We read it sometimes when we are contemplating the mysteries. We? A mystery such as myself? That would be one. Undoubtedly. Some may find their origins a mystery, but my origin is abundantly clear. I requested that you come here. I, I invited you so that you might know something I wish to confess, so that you might understand. It is the source of the distress from which I suffer, the distress you have seen. I am a clone. What? That is not possible. Clones are illegal, forbidden. Of course, but not if you are from a powerful family. My mother and father were able to conceive but one son. They felt they needed another in case something happened to him. The planning commission was persuaded, bribed, to allow a clone to be created and to have the clone appear on birth records as a brother. Their son was named Anquin Mata. You may have heard of him. I am his brother on paper, his clone in fact. Not possible. Anquin Mata is first mate of Team 8. Everyone knows the Mata family. If you were of that family, you would be captain or first mate of our team. Besides, you don't look much like Anquin. A resemblance, perhaps, but not a clone. Corrective surgery was done to make my appearance compatible with being a brother, or rather, I should say, being a spare, a backup, a tool of family ambition and pride. That is the way it was from my first years of true self-awareness. He was first, I was second. I see. So your rank? Was self-selected. I thought it was appropriate to be the opposite of my brother. But you exceed your brother in many ways, I imagine. Not the least of which is self-discipline and your skill in games. You were near besting me, you know. Thank you. But I fear I do not exceed my brother in restraint or acceptance. And when we last met, there was a circumstance. A word, duplicator, perhaps, that brought you back to a consciousness of your origins. Precisely. I, too, have something to tell. I have wanted to speak of it, and now is the time to speak truly. I am an Aquinian. <laughs> what is that, some kind of bird? It is a strange name, I admit. The members of our organization call themselves the Aquinians. Even we do not know exactly where the name comes from, except that it derives from the ancients, those we study and revere. And these studies are unpopular or perhaps subversive. Some call them subversive. Surely there is no connection to the fellowship. Of course not. Quite the opposite. We take a stronger stand against the fellowship than the government. Our government, our councils, our leaders, and our captains are weak, soft on the fellowship. I have nothing to differ with you there. Well, shall we play our game? If you like, but I won't let you in. Nor would I have it any other way. Attention, attention, this is the captain speaking. We have recently made contact with a fellowship cruiser. 
It claims that we've entered a sector within their territorial claims and demands that we leave this sector or accept a boarding party that will inspect our ship. Report to your stations. Again, all personnel, report to your stations. Stand by for further instructions. This is it. Meet me in engine room three. What? There is no time. I'm going to the captain. Captain's quarters, full speed. Full speed is not advised. Full speed. Ensign Beam. Ensign Beam has fainted. He insisted on full speed. Please assist him. Ensign Beam? Are you alright? Let me help you. Yes, uh, I'll be fine. Get me to the captain. Captain, Ensign Beam here to see you. Send him in. Ensign Beam, well, you certainly took your time. But I've been expecting you. I suppose you're here to advise me. We can't allow their inspection. They mean invasion. They will take over the ship and steal our suspended animation technology. Tell them we will leave their so-called territory. Change course. We have a backup destination, do we not? Yes. Circe 5, I checked with navigation already. Yes, we have the supplies, but this is the critical phase of the voyage. To reach Circe 5, we would need to reaccelerate. It would take nearly a century of flight time, 16 years of awake crew time. It's not an option. Somehow I suspect the Fellowship knew that, which is why they confronted us now. A boarding party is our only option. We'll wait and see what they want, and if it comes to it, we'll find a way to passively resist any attempts to subvert our mission. Are you mad? There is no such thing as a passive resistance to the Fellowship. It's either submit or die, and I'd rather die fighting. Awaken the entire crew. We'll use hand weapons. Ensign Beam, I'll not go down in history as the ship captain who precipitated a war with the Fellowship. Besides that, your suggestion is ridiculous. A hand weapon battle would destroy the ship. We cannot awaken 2,000 516 souls in S.A., only to have them engage in needless conflict. 2,516 who will wake up dead, or worse, subjects of the Fellowship. Give them a chance to fight for their freedom. Wake them up! We need maximum forces. Ensign B, credit me with at least a little foresight and knowledge. We have no time. Once I reply in the negative to their demands to change course, the boarding party will be here in less than 10 hours. To provide the crew will take at least 48 hours. We will negotiate with the boarding party. Negotiate? They have all the cards. They will simply take over the ship and steal our SA technology. That's what they want. What else can it be? And they'll use it to expand their territory. We will quietly and systematically resist. We'll find a way to save the mission. At the cost of subjugation? I will inform the crew they should retain our scientific secrets. And how long do you think they will last when the Fellowship starts torturing our secrets out of them? Besides that, some of the crew are already soft on the Fellowship. They don't see it as an enemy. The Fellowship is ruthless, true, but don't you see? I must make every effort to save the ship and our colony. I'll not have history mark me as the captain who scuttled a colony mission unnecessarily. Would you rather it mark you as the captain who gave up our technology and tipped the territorial balance in favor of the Fellowship? No, of course not. But I see no choices, Ensign. Unless you have any ideas, I'm open. Can you stall another 15 minutes before you reply? I believe I can. Then let me see what I can come up with. Engine room three. Full speed. Three quarters. Ninki, I need you. Engine room three. Ninki! Here. The captain wants to allow the boarding party. He thinks we can passively resist them. I told him we should awaken the crew and fight it out. But he's right. There's no time. He sees no other way, but there must be. Consider their gambit. They falsely claim we have come into their territory. Yes, that's their game. And what if we really came into their territory? That would be an unexpected move. 
Ah, y- yes. But how? Maybe by appearing to cooperate. Give them what they want? Yes. Give them what they want. Ortho, how long have you been listening? Ortho has ears. And Ortho has common sense. Let them come. What difference does it make? They have their system and we have ours. Two versions of the same thing. The rich win and the rest of us lose. Let them come. I see. I am saddened to hear of your choice, although I understand it. You will need to swear allegiance to a new master. What of it? You, the likes of you, have no understanding of what has been forged in the fire of my soul. They will be just like you, feeling superior and telling me what to do. While I go on my own, see my own truth, make my own fire, they will want me to say I'm one of them. I will. What's the difference? So be it, Ortho. Then you will just watch those who refuse allegiance die. Well, that's their choice. Those with common sense will survive. And what about those who love freedom? What about them? They will die too. What do you mean? Just that in the fellowship, you won't be allowed to say the kinds of things you're saying now, speaking freely, speaking your own mind. I need not speak to be free. Only those with foolish mouths will die. Yes, true. Those with mouths such as mine and ensign beams. Well, I did not mean. Ortho, do you have a Curie containment vessel? One of it. You seek to trick Ortho, little man? Have you hatched a plan, Ensign Bean? Yes, but I need the cooperation of people like Ortho. You will not have it. I know of many crew who are perfectly willing to let the Fellowship have its way. We'll save ourselves and the colony, too. All right, Ortho. There is just one favor we ask of you. I mean, when Ensign Beam and I are executed for sedition under Fellowship rule, I request that you- Sedition? Why? Well, for speaking our minds about things that matter. Mating, for instance. There is no room for freedom of choice in mating under the Fellowship. And none here. The mating commission controls everything. Only the approvals, not the applications. And no freedom even in the foods you eat, nor the information you may have, nor the sciences you may study. Oh, that is of no consequence to you, as you have said, no matter. But may I ask one thing? Ortho. One thing that you can do for us after we have been executed. I didn't mean that I wanted you executed. Only that it was inevitable. Oh, I quite understand. If you could just ask them for our bodies, if you could incinerate them in the Deck 3 furnace. You mean the one I use? Yes, that one. And then about the ashes. Um, I hope it's not asking too much. Could you take them, put them in a tiny pod, you know, the little ones used for messages? The little ones? And take them to the emergency hatch in engineering, number 12, the one you always use. And then could you set their course for the core? Because you see, we would like, or rather, I would like our ashes to mingle. Mingle forever in the core. I'm sorry, Ensign Beam, if I was presumptuous. Would you prefer military honors for yourself, or do you think what I have suggested is appropriate? Yes, it's fine. Uh, Appropriate. As you say, so shall it be done. Good. By the way, Ensign Beam, what did you have in mind with the Curie containment vessel? No, nothing much. It is of no consequence now. Just a way to create a miniature black hole in space that might absorb a small ship, like a Fellowship cruiser. See, well, so much for that. Then, I did not mean- Oh, no, 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 I quite understand. Um, Ortho, forgive me if it is asking too much. There is just one other thing I almost forgot. Could you say a few words before you send the pods into space? There are, of course, the ancient rites in which one wishes that the souls of the departed find union with the one, that the scales shall be lifted from their eyes, that 
having died for freedom, they shall be forever free and so forth. But I would not expect that. You could just say some words of your own. Words? Words? Of your own, yes, words of your own, as you have always done, whatever comes to mind. What comes to mind is that no one will tell Ortho what to do. Who can cause events for which Ortho must fashion words of hope? What need have I to fashion words? Who shall confound the lives of the poor more than they already are? Assigned mates and laws about food indeed. Who would stand for it? What were you thinking? Well? Why are you standing there? You're in my way. Stand aside, little ensign. I will bring your vessel. Brilliantly played, master. Know thy players. What is your plan? I will propose an exchange of information for free passage. We'll tempt them with an easy gain. We'll send an emissary bearing useful information from our ship to theirs. An emissary carrying a containment vessel. But where does the black hole fit in? Surely you can't just carry such a device into their ship and set it to go off after you come back. And besides, won't that start a war? It won't be like that. The vessel needs outside energy to create the hole. The cutting lasers on board might do it. Tell Ortho we need to be able to track our scout ship and aim the lasers at the airlock hatch. But what about you? I'll escape from the scout before it is set off. There's no time for details. I must go to the captain now. Bridge. Full speed? Normal speed. Calculate the energy necessary to trigger the creation of a black hole inside a Curie containment vessel. 110,481 gigajoules. And the time necessary to absorb the mass of the vessel, the scout ship carrying it, and another large mass, perhaps 100 times larger than the scout ship? It depends on the distance to the other large mass. Let's say less than one-tenth of a light second. Approximately 1.4 seconds. Ah, Ensign Beam, I was just headed your way. Well? Captain, I propose that we cooperate with the enemy. Then you approve of my plan? No. I believe we should appear to be willing to give them the information they want, our suspended animation technology, and save them the trouble of extracting it from us by force. I suggest that you offer to exchange technical information that the fellowship may find of interest, and which may be of significant value should an insignificant first wave colony ship be allowed to pass through the fringes of the fellowship's domain. I see. Information for free passage. Intriguing, but I don't know that I want to be the captain who gave state secrets to the enemy. Besides, why should they give up anything? As you said, they have all the cards. Because you should also suggest that this information, which we are willing to give via special courier, might disappear under other conditions. Disappear? How can it disappear? What do you mean? I mean that you should find a way to suggest that you would rather scuttle the ship than allow them to board. And that if they want the information, the only way they can get it is by allowing a scout ship to approach theirs with an emissary who has the information and who can be held hostage if he fails to deliver. And you, as emissary, no doubt have some other plan yet to be revealed. May I remind you, Ensign Beam, that dispensing vital secrets is treason, that lives all on board will depend on you, and that the fellowship- I am well aware, Captain. There is just one other thing. At last, we come to the nub of the matter. Suppose that there was an unmapped black hole between our location and the fellowship cruiser. Suppose the cruiser collided with it and simply disappeared. Then there would be no incident. What are you saying, Ensign Beam? I'm saying that should an event like that happen, you as captain should be prepared to immediately accelerate the ship away from the black hole. You know that whatever your scheme is, I cannot authorize it. But you could authorize a scout ship with an emissary to discuss peaceful options with the fellowship. I suppose I could. 
if nothing else, it may buy us time. I'll send a message immediately, but dole out the details of your scheme slowly. How much time do you need? At least four hours. Beam, against my better judgment, but for the sake of the colony, I'm going to trust you. You'd better not fail. I won't. Goodbye, Captain. We worked feverishly for the next four hours. Ortho brought the CCV and began modifying it. He had to cut off monitoring ports so that it could fit in the scout ship. He also had to make a new port as a target for the cutting lasers. Beam and I went over the calculations again and again and even simulated it with Cortana. It turned out we needed all the power we could get, even with the three cutting lasers operating at 11% beyond the listed maximum power we had only a 28% chance of success. The scout's escape pod too seemed dubious. Would it have enough power to get back to the Phoenix in time to avoid being sucked into the black hole? At that point, I wanted another plan, but Beam was insistent. It had to work, he said. It was his life's work. When the CCV was prepared and loaded on the scout, beams started to board immediately, even before the captain notified us that the enemy had agreed to accept an emissary. I can see him now, carrying his spacesuit up the ramp. I could not speak, and he gave me a look, such a look, before he turned away. I went to my chamber and stared out my viewport into the blackness of space, watching the little scout ship go, my heart sinking all the while. 10 hours went by. He was near the fellowship cruiser now, too near. Why had he not escaped and given Ortho the order to fire? Something was wrong, very wrong. Suddenly there appeared in my chamber a tiny hologram beam suited up in the ship's open airlock standing next to the ccv beam is that you what's happening what's wrong yes dear ninki it's me i had ortho power up a subspace channel direct to you and you alone why aren't you in the escape pod you're too close eject come back there's no possibility of that nor was there ever the instant the enemy detected the escape pod, they would suspect foul play and destroy the ship, and the pod too. No, Ninki. I suspect it is no surprise to you that in a game such as this, that a sacrifice is sometimes necessary for the greater good, for the end game, for freedom. No, Beam, please, no, come back to me, please. I cannot be. Yes, my love for you is vast, but I am defective in so many ways. Call it upon sacrifice. No, don't come back. Ortho, lock on target. Locking. Locked. Fire. No, Beam, come back! Come back, come back! And then... Through the tears, I saw a flash, and moments later the cruiser began to be distorted as it was drawn into the hole like oil down a drain. The phoenix suddenly accelerated, and I was thrown against the wall. I thought that we might not escape the black hole, even for a moment. I wished that we would not. I wished that I would join the Beta Quinmata forever. We did escape. We did. And now, next to him, there is you. And so it was, little one. And now you know where I have spoken truly. Your second father, as I like to think of him, was your real father's clone. He was much more. Oh, on <laughs> Quinn, how long have you been listening? Long enough to hear what I needed to hear. I'm sorry I got carried away. It was for Ghana. She needed to hear. She fell asleep long ago. 
It was for you. Yes, it was. I hope it was for you too. It was. There was much, very much I needed to hear. But Beta Quinn Mata was wrong about two things. Really? He was not just a clone. He was a brother, much loved, and no mere pawn. He was a knight, a glorious knight. <laughs>